I'm Shen. I'm a PhD student at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and this is my presentation, Distance Indexing and Seed Clustering in Sequence Graphs. So sequence graphs are a method of representing genomic variations, whereas a standard reference genome typically encodes just one haplotype copy of a genome, sequence graphs can represent variations from a collection of genomes. So here, the sequence graph represents these two aligned sequences. Nodes in a sequence graph are labeled with a nucleotide sequence. Nodes have two node sides, which we arbitrarily refer to as a left and right side. Edges in a graph connect two node sides. A walk through a node must enter and exit the node at, two, at the opposite node sides. So we refer to a left to right traversal of a node as the forward traversal. And in a forward traversal, we read the sequence in its forward direction. In a right to left or backwards traversal of the node, we read the sequence as a traverse complement. So in a sequence graph, we can represent simple variations. We can represent inversions and indels. And by taking a walk through the graph, we can recreate the original sequences that we used to generate it. In this particular graph, we use just two sequences to generate it. So the structure of the graph is pretty simple. But as we add more variations and nested variations, the graphs can get a lot more complicated. One of the ways that we find structure in these graphs is by defining common motifs that we call snarls and chains. So this is one example of a snarl in this graph. Intuitively, a snarl represents a variation. So these two nodes are the variants and they're flanked by these two conserved sequences. More formally, a snarl is defined by two boundary nodes that limit a subgraph between them. And the two boundary nodes must have two properties. First, they need to be separate, meaning that if you split the node into the, if you split the boundary nodes into the two node sides, you separate the subgraph from the rest of the graph. Secondly, they must be minimal, meaning that there's no node within the subgraph that is separable with either of the boundary nodes. Snarls commonly occur contiguously with each other with a shared boundary node between them. And a sequence of these contiguous snarls is what we call a chain. So here, this chain contains two snarls that have this shared boundary node. We call a chain that has only one snarl a trivial chain. And these chains can be nested within parent snarls. So this snarl contains these two chains. And we describe the nested organization of these snarls and chains in a structure called a snarl tree. So in this tree, um, each chain in the, the sequence graph is represented by one of these rectangular nodes. And each snarl is represented by one of these elliptical nodes. So here, the top level structure is this chain AM, which contains two child chains AK and KM, and the snarl AK has two child chains, the trivial chain GJ, and the, um, this chain BF. One of the common use cases of these sequence graphs is as a reference genome that you can map new sequencing reads to. And mapping algorithms typically follow the same seed cluster extend paradigm. So for these algorithms, you start out with a read that you want to map to a reference, and you split up the read into these short subsequences. And you find where each of the subsequences maps to on your reference to get these short seed alignments. You then cluster the alignments so that seeds that are close to each other on the reference get put into the same cluster, and then extend these clusters of short alignments to get your final alignments. And this clustering step is useful because it allows you to filter out the unlikely seeds, but it's also very expensive in sequence graphs because you need to find the distance between every pair of seeds. And when your graph is as big as a, a whole genome graph, that can get very slow. So we wanted to implement two algorithms. The first was a minimum distance algorithm where you're given two oriented positions and you want to find the di minimum distance from the first position going forward to the second position, um, measuring distance in nucleotides. 
The second algorithm was a clustering algorithm. So here you're given an arbitrary number of positions. And in this algorithm, we don't care about the orientation of the positions. So I'm depicting them with these X's instead of the arrows. And we want to partition these positions so that if the minimum distance between two positions is small enough, they get put into the same cluster. And to make these algorithms fast, we created a distance index that stores minimum distance information between nodes in the graph. Our algorithms are implemented in VG, which is a variation graph toolkit. A variation graph is a type of sequence graph, so it contains the same graph structure that I just described and additionally stores these embedded paths through the graph that typically corresponds to reference and alternate scaffolds. And VG already implements an estimation of distance that's based on these embedded paths. So for this algorithm, you take your two positions, find a path that contains both of the nodes that they're on, and then the estimate is the distance between the node, the positions on the shared path. And in the case where you don't have a shared path, you start from one of the positions and walk out along the graph until you find a node that does have a shared path with the second node. And then add to the distance of the traversal, the distance between the positions in the shared path. And this estimation of distance is pretty good, but there are cases when your graph isn't going to have any paths at all, so you can't use this distance estimation. And sometimes you just never find a shared path, so you would have to walk arbitrarily far out from the positions. So we wanted a distance estimation that wasn't based on these embedded paths, and we chose minimum distance. So our algorithm is based on a couple properties of sequence graphs. The first is that any walk from inside a Snarler chain to a node outside of it must pass through one of the Snarler chain's boundary nodes. Accordingly, any minimum distance walk from a node inside a Snarler chain to a node outside of it must include a minimum distance walk from the nodes to the, one of the boundary nodes of the containing Snarler chain. And because of these properties, the minimum distance calculation can be broken up into minimum distance calculations from a node to the boundaries of its containing snarl, from the boundaries of a snarl to the boundaries of its containing chain, and between children of a snarl or chain. And to make this, that's the basic idea behind our minimum distance algorithm. And to make it fast, we wanted to implement an index that would allow us to quickly calculate the minimum distance between any two nodes in a snarl and between boundary nodes of snarls in a chain. So for each snarl on the graph, we, our minimum distance index stores the minimum distance between any two pair of node sides in the snarl. So for example, from the right side of A, we can reach the left side of B and C with distance zero, the left side of D with distance two, and the distance to any other node side is going to be infinite. So we store this for every pair of node sides in this snarl and we get this matrix. For chains, we store three vectors of distance information. The first is a prefix sum vector, which stores the distance from the start of the chain to the start of every boundary node of a snarl along the chain. So this distance here to here is 20, out to here is 35, and so on for the rest of the chain. Using this vector and the lengths of each of the nodes, we can find the minimum distance between any two boundary nodes of snarls in this chain in a traversal of the chain that doesn't change direction. But in some cases, finding the minimum distance requires a path that turns around at the chains. So this distance this minimum distance path has to loop around and come back. And because of this, we also have to store what we call loop distances. So the distance to leave a node at one node side, turn around in the chain and come back to the same node side. So for this node going forward, that distance is 30. For the next one, it's six. And for the rest of the nodes in this chain, it's infinite because you can't turn around going forward. <laughs> 
and you do the same thing for the backwards direction. And using these three vectors and the lengths of the boundary nodes, we can find the minimum distance between any two node sides of boundary nodes in this chain. So we use this distance index to support our minimum distance algorithm. And again, the basic idea of the minimum distance algorithm is to start from the position and walk up the snarl tree and at each snarl or chain find the minimum distance from the position to both sides of the parent snarl or chain. And then at the lowest common ancestor, we find the minimum distance between the two children. So starting from the first so to start out, we find the lowest common ancestor, which in this case is the chain AM. And we want to walk up the snarl tree and find the distance, minimum distances to the boundary nodes of its two children, AK and KM. So from the first position, it's contained in the snarl BD. So we find the minimum distance to the ends of these two boundary nodes. And since we're finding the oriented distance, um, the distance to B going backwards is going to be infinite. Next, we walk up to the parent of snarl BD, which is the chain BF, and we want to find the distance from the position to the boundary nodes B and F. We already know the distances to B and D, so we use the distance index to look up the all possible distances from B and D to the boundary nodes of its parent chain B and F. So there are four possible distances. We add those to the distances we've already found and take the minimum to find the distances to the ends of B and F. And we do this walking up the snarl tree to the child of the common ancestor for both of the positions. And then within the common ancestor, we find the distance between these two children, AK and KM. Again, there's four possible distances. We add them up, take the minimum to find the final distance. And in this case, we can stop here because the lowest common ancestor happens to be the um, root of the snarl tree. But in the general case, we have to walk all the way up the snarl tree because the minimum distance path that you found at the lowest common ancestor might be a lot longer than a minimum distance path that you found at one of its ancestors. So we have to walk all the way up the, to the root of the snarl tree to find the actual minimum distance. So the second algorithm we implemented was this clustering algorithm. So again, the idea is that you're given some number of positions and we want to partition them so that if the minimum distance between two positions is smaller than a given distance limit, they get put into the same cluster. So the idea behind the clustering algorithm is very similar to the minimum distance algorithm. Again, we're using the distance index and walking up the snarl tree and at each structure in the snarl tree, we maintain one of these clusters. So a cluster of positions is associated with one of these structures and it's annotated with the minimum distance from any position in the cluster to the boundary nodes of the structure that it's on. To start out, we put each of these positions in its own cluster on a node. So each of these clusters has is annotated with a minimum distance to the ends of the node. And as we walk up the snarl tree at each structure, we look at all of the clusters of its children, compare them, and possibly combine the clusters. So for this snarl BD, two of its children have clusters, so B and C, and we want to find the minimum distance between every pair of clusters. So we do this again using the minimum distance index. Um, we find the four possible distances between the nodes that the clusters are on, add those to the distances we already found for the clusters to get the distance between the clusters, and if they're small enough, we combine those two clusters. And then we need to find the distances from these positions to the ends of the clusters, and we do this the same way we do in the minimum distance algorithm, where we add up the distances to the ends of the snarl of the nodes, the distances from the node to the chain, to the ends of the snarl, to get the distance from any position to the ends of the snarl. And we do this for every parent snarl or chain in the snarl tree. So we walk up to 
chain BF. Two of its children have clusters on them. So again, we compare the distances between the, the two clusters and extend those distances to the ends of the chain all the way up to the root of the sorrel tree where we get our final clusters. So those were the two algorithms, algorithms that we implemented. And the first thing we wanted to show for these algorithms was that minimum distance was a useful estimation. And we expect minimum distance to be useful in the context of structural variance. So for our first experiment, we used a graph with simulated structural variance. So it contained indels between um, 10 and 1,000 base pairs long. We found random 150 base pair walks through the, this graph and filtered those walks to keep only the ones that occurred near the junctions of structural variance. We then found two random pairs of positions in these walks and found and estimated the distance between them. So when we used the path-based distance algorithm, the distance that we found in the walk varied greatly from the actual distance in the walk. So for example, this point here was two, about 200 base pairs longer than we expected it to be. But the minimum distance was a better estimation because it more closely found the distance that we expected in the walk. Second, we wanted to look at the runtime of our minimum distance algorithm, and we compared it to the path-based distance algorithm and Dijkstra's algorithm. Here we used a graph that contained real data, so it had the variance from the 1000 Genomes project, and we again found random 150 base pair walks and random positions within that, and calculated the distance. And all three algorithms had similar runtimes, although the path-based and Dijkstra's algorithm got a lot slower sometimes. Next, we picked random positions from anywhere in the graph, so they could be arbitrarily far away. And in this case, the minimum distance algorithm, the new one, got a little bit slower, and the path-based and Dijkstra's algorithm both got a lot slower. Next, we wanted to look at the runtime of the clustering algorithm. And in a log-log plot of runtime versus the number of positions that we clustered, the regression line makes it look like our algorithm is close to linear in the number of positions. So now we've been working on this new fast short read mapping algorithm called Giraffe that uses our minimum distance clustering algorithm. And I'd like to thank my lab, especially Jordan, Adam, and Yoni, and my PI Benedict. And thanks for watching my presentation.